How's it going? Welcome to the Entrepreneur Experiment Podcast with me, Gary Fox. This week, my guest is the iconic Sonia Lennon. Sonia is a founder, a campaigner for social equality and justice, and she's a media superstar. But there's many different sides to Sonia, which I was delighted to get to uncover in this week's deep dive episode. Welcome to the Entrepreneur Experiment. This is my chat with Sonia Lennon. Sonia, welcome to the pod. Thank you. I like what you've done with the place. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. You are our first podcast guest of 2024 in the cinema. Nice. That feels auspicious. Yes. Well, I'm excited. It's nice you do when you're like, this is going to be really good. Good. Um, you know this place very well. I do. Yeah. I've done some work with Iconic. They're an amazing team. And this is one of my favorite spaces, I have to say. It's mad, isn't it? Like it's when I tell people, I'm like, oh, there's a private cinema in Stephen's Green. They're like, what? Where? It sounds really cool and it is really cool. We've done some lives in here with a little studio audience. It's lovely. Lovely atmosphere. It's a really nice space. Sonia, I'm delighted. Your name's cropped up a lot. Oh, yeah? All good. <laughs> I'm like, who should I chat to? Who's a, who's a great founder? And your name's popped up a lot. So okay. for people not familiar, just give a quick overview as to what you do. So I am, I suppose, a serial founder. I'm a social entrepreneur and an entrepreneur. So currently... Um, I am the founder of Work Equal, which is a nonprofit that supports marginalized and underrepresented people into employment um, and brings them towards uh, economic sustainability. It's particularly pertinent at the moment um, because of big societal themes like social cohesion um, and the challenges that we face with the far right movement. Um, and I truly believe that if people feel valued and feel purposeful within society, um, they will play their part in the so social contract for the good of all. Um, and I think we have a very, very strong and clear responsibility as people who are educated and privileged to weaponize that pri privilege for those less well off. So that's one. <laughs> I don't know where we go from here. That was <laughs> the other is a fashion brand. <laughs> <laughs> You've great du uh, duopoly, is it? You've great. Du You've whatever got duality, whatever you want, yeah. whatever you want. No, so Len and Courtney is, I suppose, uh, one of the other organizations that I founded with Brendan Courtney. We started off as a women's wear brand. We're now a women's life lifestyle brand, encompassing homeware and accessories, soon to be home fragrance and jewellery. And we are in partnership now with Kilkenny Design, which launched last November um, 2023. And we are on a shared journey with a shared ambition to bring Len and Courtney global. So we are undertaking a strategy to enter US and UK markets with the brand and with the help of Enterprise Ireland. And in fact, we are showcasing to a private room of 80 international buyers as part of showcase with an international press pack next week. Wow. So that's very exciting. We, we founded the brand 12 years ago. We were independent at first. When we first showed at London Fashion Week, we were in vogue. Uh, on the first day of Fashion Week. Is that a blessing or a curse? No, it's a blessing. I mean, that's fantastic. I mean, it's such an imprimatur. And we sold into about 30 boutiques. We were in Harvey Nichols. Um, we had a UK presence. We were covered in USL. Um, we were, to all in extents and purposes, a hugely successful young fashion brand. Um, but three years into that independent rise, we realized that the model was eating itself and it just wasn't working. We didn't have any buying power with our manufacturers. Uh, we were beleaguered by all of the gubbins that goes with setting up a manufacturing business with none of the power. We were self-funded, bootstrapped and broken by the time it came to year three. And Do you mean financially, physically, emotionally? What do you mean broken? All of the above all of the above. I mean, we were ready to kill it at that stage. Okay. And probably each other. Um, because it was just so hard. And the more we grew, and th this is the irony, I suppose, of a business like that. Season on season, our order book was growing by 25, 26, 
but the model was eating itself. We had to, you know, develop our human resources. We had to um, spend more on the orders, on the manufacturing. We were facing into cash flow crunches twice a year that were crippling. And we just knew we couldn't do it anymore. And I suppose that was the first time in my career that I sort of thought about, well, I know there's value in this. Mm-hmm. People love what we do. Um, they can't always afford what we do when we go on sale. There's a queue out the door. Um, what were you producing? What kind of so stuff? That was women's wear. And we had started as an online brand. And we had to respond to the demand. We had then opened a little tiny store on Stephen Street uh, called the Central Dairy. And we would put a little retail space in there, which was so beautiful. And it's remembered so fondly by everybody. And ironically, it was in the shadow of Dunn Stores head office and when we when things were really bad <laughs> I remember um, Brendan kind of throwing the ledger off the desk and saying I've had enough I can't take this anymore and uh, I just kind of pointed up to to Dunn's stores like it was kind of like a Tourette's movement and I said what about Dunn's <laughs> <laughs> and myself and Brendan and Philip, who worked for us at the time all kind of looked over like puppy dogs, you know, and uh, we thought, well, maybe. And very, very promptly with a series of swift conversations, we entered into um, a partnership with Duns, which uh, was phenomenal and lasted seven years. And we grew the brand and we democratized the brand. So That's we such a bizarre moment, though, isn't it? Bizarre. Those like kind of moments where you're struggling and struggling and struggling. And then you just go, has to be another way. Over the past five years in this podcast, I've spoken to so many amazing Irish businesses who started from a single idea and grown to become world-class companies able to compete with the very best on the international stage. And many of those started and grew with the help of their local enterprise office. From starting up to growing to becoming more sustainable or digitization, your local enterprise office has everything you need to make that happen for your business. Visit localenterprise.ie or click the link in the podcast description. Okay, you know me. You know I'm massively into my health, fitness, and training. But there's one thing I haven't spoken about before, and that is a product I take every single day. It's a product called Resilience, and it's made by an Irish company called Ethos. What's kind of funny is that every single entrepreneur I meet, that is the one characteristic they have, incredible resilience. So I like that little play on words. It's a multifunctional supplement that supports cognitive function, immunity, which is super important this time of year, energy levels, and it keeps stress at bay. I also love it because it's easy. If you're bringing anything new habit into your life, it has to be easy, and taking resilience is so simple. I simply mix it in a glass of water every single morning, and I always throw a couple of extra in my gym bag to keep them with me. It's a really tasty blood orange flavor as well. It takes all the boxes. It has B vitamins, amino acids, vitamin C, and adaptogens like reishi mushroom and ashwagandha. So, if you wanna try it, I think you should. Go to weareethos.com and because I like it so much, the guys have given me a discount code. So if you go to weareethos.com, enter Gary Fox at the checkout, you'll get 20% off, which makes taking resilience about a euro a day, which is an unbelievable price for building some inner resilience. Check out weareethos.com. If you've been listening for a while, you know Iconic Offices have been my partner for ages now. Working and recording out of their flexible workspaces has meant a huge deal to the success of this podcast. So it made perfect sense to partner up with them again for season 17, but to give you, my fellow entrepreneurs, a unique offer. Come work in the Iconic Office workspaces for free with no catches. Simply visit the link in the description below and enter Gary24 for a free day pass or a free day office pass. Enjoy. And I think that is, it's one of the big learnings for me is... If it's valueless, kill it. But if there's some value in it, if people love it, if there's something, some gold in there, what can you do to remodel it, to find another way? And quite often, um, again, along my career, it's been about leveraging partnerships, relationships, leveraging shared skill sets, leveraging, you know, Sometimes standing on the shoulders of giants, you know, we, we, I've always kind of come into these relationships with something to give, but something that's more ephemeral and more um, niche 
than the partner. Mm. So, And I think that's the way to do it. There's no point going into partnership with somebody if you both do the same thing. Yeah. Um, and so what we took was a really keen eye for aesthetic, for understanding what women want, for creating clothes that made women feel fabulous. And we were able to bring that to a wider distribution and democratize it through the partnership with Duns. This is beautiful. And this is something I really want to dig into with you because you've, you've touched on something really special there. And it's, it's the thing that trips up so many founders. The people looking at you, what a success. Oh my God, they're in vogue and they're here and they're there. And people look at it and go, oh, it's brilliant. And often the founder gets kind of swept up in that and, and gets to the point whereby they don't get to that point after three years. They get to the point after eight years and it just the whole thing just collapses in on itself. I think the honest answer to that is that if we hadn't had another business at the same time, which was Frock Advisor, which was a tech business, if we hadn't had a funded business with 17 staff, offices in Dublin and London, and a huge um, expectation around success in that business, we probably would have lumbered on longer with Len and Courtney without hitting that realisation that we couldn't shoulder both businesses okay. at the same time um, and and Work Equal was dressed for success at the time so it was actually three startups simultaneously um, and what that required of, of me and of Brendan and myself um, in both of those ventures was just beyond sustainable it, it, we couldn't we couldn't keep it going and I think that's why something had to give um, and that's what precipitated that Remodeling. What was the point, Sonia? Was it was it like a gradual building, or was it just like, oh, I just reached the, the wall here? I think it was gradual, gradual, gradual explosion, mm. and I think that's the way it goes. Yeah. Um. You can you can do it for so long, but then something just tips you over, and that's the end of it. You were running three businesses. Yeah. Talk to me about the Frock Advisor piece. What was the idea there? So Frock Advisor, I suppose. When I look back at it, it started, myself and Brendan had both been presenters on Off the Rails. It had been hugely successful. We had done seven series with RTE. We had, we were both, both had really big profiles. We had a lot of trust and recognition uh, in the space. We were testing top of the heap in audience polls. People loved us. They, they, they loved what we did. If we if we showed something on a makeover on TV, it would sell out the next day. Um, and we met a branding expert who was a friend of Brandon's who said, look, you have trust and recognition. They can't be bought. You have them in the bag. You add to that newness and relevance and you have something that can be commodified, something that you can commercialise and create and bring to market. And we had already been kind of messing around sketching magic knickers on napkins and thinking what will we do and we'd had a few kind of embryonic conversations with retailers about you know we can we can do this we can make you know shapewear sexy i mean <laughs> i think kim kardashian owns that now but um <laughs> you, you had the idea <laughs> you had the idea uh, and <laughs> and then one thing led to another we had another conversation with somebody who was um in manufacturing and distribution out of the Far East and, and he said the same thing. He said, why do you guys not have a range? Mm. It's everything you, you put on um, on screen sells out. Why do you not have a range? And I suppose we f sort of bumbled into it at that stage in complete naivety. So we had one business which was SaaS, tech-based, another business which was um, manufacturing, product-based, um, two completely different ways of doing business, um, one wholesale, one two-sided. And so to go back to your question, which I never answered, Frog Advisor was a marketplace app for mid-range independent boutiques and boutique shoppers. Okay. So we saw, when we had our profile from Off the Rails um, and we wrote two books. And in the back of both of the books, we catalogued all of the shops that we loved all around Ireland. And where there were the bigger shops, we were able to put in websites, I don't think it was even social media handles at that stage. It was you're going back to, say, 2010. Um, but some of the the forward ones had websites, and none of the independents had websites. And we thought, how are these guys gonna mm. exist? How are they gonna survive this digital wave unless they're plugged into some sort of um, 
digital platform and originally when we started looking at building our own website it was a, a content website pure and simple um, but through our entry into the sort of uh, startup ecosystem of course we got swept into a slipstream of app development and, and sudden, the marketplace and mar- 2010 were all the rage uh, all the rage and I'd say one in a hundred got anywhere oh, you know? at least, at, but, probably uh, at least yeah. like wild isn't yeah. it funny how you can just get kind of like drawn totally. in you know what you should do you know what you should do you yeah. know what you should and sometimes you don't know you don't know and we certainly didn't know and i suppose it was th- it it afforded us an opportunity naively to follow the money so we were following the funding and the only way to get the funding was to do what the people told us to do. Yeah. And uh, we developed a beautiful piece of technology. We had amazing investors, amazing team. Um, and we just, we, we couldn't make it work. And in, in many ways, we had a buy it now functionality on the app. So people were posting a product raw in store, taking away the need to catalogue their, their full inventory. Um, and they would have an interface where they would say the size is available, the colors available, and the um, the customer could just do a buy it now button, just like Instagram has now. Yeah. And uh, so this is going back. This would have been started development around 2012, 2013. It's early, like. Early. You know, now if you're launching that, people are like, yeah, I see how that work. Yeah, I mean, I think there were fundamental issues around the target market that they d- didn't want to see technology as a solution. So a lot of these people were um, retailers who, much like I value relationships, they valued the customer walking through the door. They saw that as the holy grail of selling and it trumped any digital sale um, every time. And so a call comes in to say, I, you know, buy it now, this product on a Thursday and the retailer would, we'd, call the retailer on the Monday and say, oh, you got to buy it now. And you, did you ship it? No, I wanted to wait until after the weekend to see if it sold to somebody who walked through the door. <laughs> You're just like, oh, my God. <laughs> but isn't it so interesting how, like, we look, we, we'll do it on the whiteboard and we come yeah. up with all these great ideas. Conceptually brilliant. <laughs> human psychology. I always said to my friend, we're not in business, we're in the human psychology totally. game because that's what it is. Yeah, and you, you can't necessarily legislate for people who have a different driver to you and and most people do you know so but look it was um it was horrendous and brilliant uh it was exciting and horrific uh, all at the same time <laughs> and uh we had to call it and i and i think even even saying that's enough now was such a learning process how did you do that um, so we we gave it everything for five years and then we had really worked hard again, another theme, stand on the shoulders of giants, try and work with, you know, big traditional media to create agile fashion content. Uh, we were creating a huge amount of content at the time and we agreed with our board um, that we would pull we would try and pull three big final levers and we would give ourselves six months to pull those levers and if they didn't work, we'd have to call it. And and that was kind of a brilliant process because it gave us real clarity. It made it an unemotional decision. And and when it didn't work, um, everybody was on board with that. It was time to pull the plug. Uh, but we were broken. <laughs> like we were just same again, just kind of humiliated really as people who had a public profile. I wanted to ask you about that. You, sorry, just to touch on something there. You said something beautiful to me just off camera, but sometimes you need to plan your failure to let your brain process it. I think you do. I think you do. And I think that that allows you to intellectualize the process and mm-hmm. take the pain of the emotion out of it. Um, and I, I don't I don't even think that's a gendered thing. I think I think when you work really hard at something and it isn't working, that that smarts, regardless of who you are. Um, and and I and, and what we did was we planned our failure. We try these things. If it doesn't work, that's the end of it. But that's only half the story, because you get to the end of it, you pull the plug and and you're you know, you are an embodiment of an experience wrapped in emotion. You're you're throbbing with pain and humiliation. And so what we decided, I remember at the time, there were other uh, startups that had had folded. And there was a lot of 
press releases being issued about, oh, it was, you know, with huge sadness that we have to announce da 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 da. I remember looking at the press releases and thinking, that's a mad thing to do, <laughs> you know? But we had a profile and we thought, what what is the right thing to do here? Mm. We've we've worked really hard. We've had to let 17 people go, which was brutal. Thankfully they all got really, really good jobs um from from the, the training and the work that we'd all done together. Um and we decided to do nothing, which is rarely the right thing to do in business, you know? Um it was June and uh we were tossing up what to do, how to announce it to the press, and we just said, nothing. Just do nothing. Go and enjoy the summer. Pick yourself up again. Let's talk in September and see how we feel. Sure, of course, by September when we regrouped, it was like, sure, nobody cares. Businesses fail all the time. I was going to ask you, is that what happened? Because like... 100%. We all think we're like the main character. In, in our own story, exactly, maybe. Exactly, you know? right? No one. I always say this to people, and I'm like, if someone's having a hard time, and I'm, I'd say, I mean this in the best way possible. Yeah. No one gives a fuck. Yeah, totally. No one cares. I mean, I, uh, and I say, I mean this with love. Yeah. Nobody cares. Yeah. <laughs> but it's so freeing when you're like, in your head, you're like, oh, what are they going to think? What are they going to think? And in their head, they're going, what have I have to, I have to collect, I have to collect the baby at, yeah. at five. And then I got to get home. Oh, that fucking email I didn't send yeah. earlier. But that's, uh, what's that book? The Five Regrets of the Dying, the palliative care nurse who oh, yes. interviewed all yeah, the, yeah. The, the people on their deathbed. And I wish I didn't care what other people thought throughout my life is yeah. one of the five, you know? And I think, uh, yeah, uh, maybe it's something to do with a bit of maturity as well that you, you, you once you once you know that, you can't really unknow it. I think And it's so. a great gift. I think I always talk about momentum. Once you have momentum, like you, you, you sound like a person, just you're, you're filled with momentum, you're filled with energy, you're filled with drive. I think when you can just kind of go, okay, on we go. Yeah. It's, it's, it's when you kind of harbour on it and labour on it and you kind of you let it become your identity. Yeah. Just like you let the business become your identity, sometimes you can let the failure become, and you make excuses and you start to blame and it's it's a toxic spiral. Yeah. Whereas if you just go, no one cares, on to the next thing. Yeah, definitely. And, and that's a great story. Thank you for sharing that. And thank you for being <laughs> so open because sometimes people are like, oh yeah, I had this thing, it didn't work out. Anyway. Oh, I wear my heart in my sleeve. What can I say? <laughs> but like, that's why I love doing long form because you get to properly understand people and you get to properly kind of go through it because especially in Ireland, it's, it's really good to just have open conversations about successes and failures because we all need, I always say you need to see it to be it. Mm. People need to see Sonia and go, that's exactly the problem I'm having. Mm. Maybe it's not such a big deal. Maybe I can let that go or maybe I can start that thing. So thank you so much for sharing. So you were running two other businesses at the same time, Len and Courtney then, you came back in September and what was happening there? So at that stage, we had uh, brokered a partnership with Duns and we went into Duns and that was really well met and, and fantastic. And we, I, I think we took it as far as we could take with them and we then had to rethink it a little bit um, and and that I suppose was the second time that we we said we we need to go and have a think about what the next best step is for the brand. Um, we kind of maxed out the opportunity. Um, How do you refresh? Because I think people sometimes kind of go on too long with things. Whereas you seem to have a very keen sense of when it's time to reevaluate. I think COVID was a big part of that. You know, it 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 reframed a lot of priorities. Um, and we had for everybody um, and we had to really think about what the next best move for us as individuals was and also age comes into it you know um, I'm now 55 so say when these conversations started 53 and the, the, the cold hard fact of it is I have a brand now I have ambitions to grow this internationally um, with my business partner, we need to shit or get off the pot. We need to do it. You know, do we believe in it? Have we seen that there is an appetite internationally for this brand? Absolutely. Um, do we have the structure and the experience to do this properly? Yes, we do. Have we been approached by other people? Yes, we have. Right now, what we need is space. We can't find that space in our current environment, so we move away. Mm. And we give ourselves the space to think with the faith that we can find a new way to do things, not for the first time. Mm. And that's, yeah, it, it, in that space, 
the right opportunity presented itself. And I, I that 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 takes a bit of a leap of faith. It does. How do you how did you get there? Because that does take a lot of leap of faith. I just think we both felt we weren't doing the brand the service it deserved. Um and we we had, you know, we had made no uh, secret of the fact that we wanted to expand internationally. But, you know, it, unless that aligns with your partner's priorities, it's not going to happen. Mm. So, um, and then just literally out of, you know, out of a moonbeam came this opportunity where we found a partner who was embedded in our Irish retail and Irish design, you know, for 70 years. And had global ambition and it just it was like sparks it just felt like we we have so much to offer you and any relationship is about um a power play and 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 a symbiosis and a value circle where where is the value and where is everybody being fed there yeah. and you know a, a good negotiation is one where everybody feels they've won um and that's really sort of the spirit in which we entered into this new partnership and and we we all really believe in it. Isn't there something powerful there though when you just give yourself that that moment that week that that time to just process and often it's happened to you two or three times now in, in this story you've told me like the answer appears the answer emerges if you just give yourself that space to think and let things crystallize it's like the muddy water analogy where the water's all swirling, swirling, swirling. Just stop twisting the water. Yeah. Just let it settle for a second and suddenly the the idea emerges. Yeah, and I think you do need a bit of quiet for that to happen. And certainly I have found that I had to push myself to think about things in a different way. So I suppose during that time of intense change and uncertainty, um, I engaged with an executive coach just to see you know what what part was I playing in what wasn't working and I think that's a question that you have to ask yourself um, because you, you mentioned the word blame and I think you know really blaming anybody else for what's going on there's not much utility in that mm. there's no control in it you're, it, see, it, by, you're by blame, giving away your you're control. giving away your power by blaming somebody else for what's happened. Um, so I engaged with an, a very expensive executive coach who I couldn't afford at the time. And yet I knew that it was the point in my life where I needed to invest in myself and, and, and in getting better with the decisions that I made. And, and I suppose it was her kind of wisdom around you know, what are what are you striving for? Like if you do nothing else, you're grand. Like what what's all this about? Why why do you feel the need to set your jaw against the world and go at a hundred miles an hour? And and that really got me thinking about um where my head needed to be to to really make the right decisions. Mm. It's really interesting you said about the expensive coach and the price. Um there's a price for a success, isn't there? You really have to figure out what it well, is and pay I have it, whether it's you, money or time yeah, or whatever it is. You have to invest and, and, yeah. and you have to uh, acknowledge that you're investing. And he, she, like this person, I couldn't afford this person when I went to her. And and I said, you know, I, I'm sorry, I can't afford that. Well, we do half the term um, for half the price. And she said, no, it doesn't work that way. It's a process and there's a duration to it. And she said, if you, if, if you paid half the price... What would that mean to you financially? And I said, it would hurt. And she said, that's enough. Hmm. Are you bought in yeah. physically and emotionally yeah. and mentally? Yeah. I think that, I think the world, the world we live in now, there's, there's so much information and there, we've never had more information, but often you need to pay the price to sit down with someone to curate that for you. It has to be personal and, and it has to mean something. Yeah. And I mean, Outside of all of that, the chemistry has to be right, the experience, the expertise yeah. has to be right, and there needs to be an element of due diligence around that. Of course, I'm not saying fire your money around the place and expect brilliant results. You know, do your homework. But I think if you feel that chemistry is right, um, and you're, and I think if you're, if you're saying to yourself, I can't afford to spend that on myself, why? 
Mm. You know, on myself you, is the key word. It is though, isn't it? On myself. Yeah, on myself. Yeah, yeah. If, if it was for, <laughs> for your, your son or your daughter, no problem. Or for yeah. your partner or for your family, you'd be like, yeah. just do it. Whereas when it's, there's there's a definitely a guilt thing there. And totally. Self-investment is the best investment. Throw out all the cliches while we're at it. What was it you uncovered, if you're willing to speak openly about that? What was it that you were like, that's what I've been holding me back? Um, I think it was a number of things. I think it was the approach to work. Um, I think it allowed me to acknowledge my own successes and to enjoy them a little bit more um, and build on them without murdering myself um, and to understand a new pace that is kinder to me and um, still gets things done um, to value myself and my time more and so you know I, I speak all, all over the world I, I I'm, I, it's such a gorgeous job. I, I love the sound of my own voice, so I love sharing <laughs> with other people. But uh, you know, significantly increasing the rates to speak, um, and and the first couple of times that somebody comes back and says that's out of budget, you're thinking to yourself, shit, shit. And then I thought, no, not shit. No, because I'd much rather yeah. do, um, you know, f- five gigs at the rate that I believe I'm worth than you know, 20 gigs at a lower rate because my time is too valuable for that. And so you have to kind of, again, it's that resolve piece, the trust, the belief. It's okay. Mm. I've done enough. You said something to me earlier and I've been thinking about it all in my head all the time since we're chatting. You're moving from striving to thriving. Yeah. Describe that to me. Describe that process and how that's kind of mentally shifted for you. I suppose that was the 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 big learning from from the coaching session um, was that that change of mindset and sort of repositioning what what has been achieved to date. And by the way, like th- so, that was over a year ago, and the last year has been has been in a way part of the strive to put all the pieces in place to enter this year now, knowing that things have a firm foundation. And, and to let the flow happen. So, mm. you know, once you know that you have a new vista ahead of you, it doesn't mean that you can just step on to a new landmass. You, you, you still have to put the work in place to ensure that everything's solid. Um, and, and that is not to say that I am complacent about the rest of my career journey at all, I know without a shadow of a doubt that there are going to be huge challenges ahead that I can't foresee um, and that I will have to go back into war mode um, before before my time is up. But that's okay. And probably the stakes will be higher and probably the cost will be greater. But my resources have also increased to meet those challenges. And, and I always game up, I have some bizarre and perverse ability to gamify a challenge anyway. It's a bit Winston Churchill-y, you know, it's like, okay, so this is a shit show. What can we do with it? How can we turn it into something that that wasn't available to us before? Mm. So the problem solver mentality, just like... Yeah, but that, and that's, that's, I'm glad you brought up that term problem solver because it is always kind of seen as a very positive att- attribute. It is also, you know, when they say you're... Uh, your talents overplayed are your weaknesses, your skills overplayed are your weaknesses. Um, as a problem solver, you run the risk of thinking that everything is a problem to be solved. Interesting. Whereas actually so many things are situations to be navigated. You cannot solve them. And having the good grace to know what's a situation and what's a problem is is fantastic. And And to be able to say, okay, I can't fix that, but I can find a way around it. Describe that to me. Uh, break it out for me, because that's a really interesting observation that like, there's certain situations, certain problems. Yeah. So, so a lot of a lot of I would think a lot of situations are relational. You know, so you might have an issue with somebody um, that you see as a problem. It's not really a problem because. You've, you've made it a problem based on somebody else's behavior or how they interact with you. That's them. No conversation with anybody has ever ended with them saying, you're absolutely right. I'm going to change into what 
you want me to be. <laughs> that has never happened in the history of humanity, right? So put it down, forget about it. The problem is yours. You've created the problem wrapped around a situation. So either the situation is one that you have to chop off and you can't deal with anymore or you find a way around it. Trying to make it better is not within your gift. So it's more like a perception. I think it is, mm. you know. It, it's the, it's the, it is the mindset with which you enter into the challenges that you face. Some of them are problems that have solutions and that's great, but not all of them. Okay, so wisdom has been able to describe what's a problem I and what's a situation. I, I, I think it's helpful. Yeah, I was trying to think in my head going, well, that's a choice. I use that in my head yep. all the time when I hear someone complaining or I, I even start to think, oh, oh that's awful myself. I go, that's a choice. Yeah. You have a choice whether to engage here or you have a choice not to. Everything is a choice. When you look back on yourself and you start back at yourself first, it's a choice. It's a choice and, to And engage. honestly, I think that's why I was so driven with Work Equal um, to to change the conversation around around social mobility and all of that Um all that, that ensues with that because money is choice and if you don't have money you don't have choice um, and that's why I was so passionate about unlocking um, y- you know economic sustainability particularly for women at the beginning whereas yes we have choices we can choose how we um, engage with something or how we respond to something but if you don't have any money you don't have any choice mm-hmm. so so yeah. so that choice is coming from a posi- position of privilege to begin with. How did you get involved with this? Um, so through my broadcasting, I was being approached by non-profits all the time, you know, to be the face of this or to MC that or, you know, lend myself to this ad. And it was all too ad hoc for me. And I thought, well, if I'm, I, I do feel a draw to do something, to use my profile for some sort of social impact. And I don't know where that came from. Um, but I want to, I want it to be intentional, and at the time I had four year old twins, and I thought to myself, well, helping children who are the most vulnerable in our society is the natural turning point for me. Mm-hmm. And then when I read about Dress for Success, the ethos was to um, to help women towards uh, sustainable futures. And I read a piece of research around the importance of the high self esteem of the mother. Um, in the development of the child. And I thought, oh my God, we can stop the problem before it begins. Go up the chain. Up like the that. chain, yeah. throw the pebble in up yeah. the stream. And that that's really um, always my thinking. It's like, I don't want to fix the problems. I'd much rather fix the causes. Yeah. It goes back to what we are just talking yeah. about, about, you know, sometimes the situation just stop. Yeah. And it goes back to the original point you made about stop, pause, think, reflect then act yeah so how because it's evolved quite a bit like what was it and what is it now it was dress for success initially so when i read about it initially it was um a, a run out in new york dress for success worldwide licensed it into metropolitan areas all over the world I think there was like 120 licensed uh, branches when i applied and i applied with absolutely no experience in organization building whatsoever um it took about a year and a half to be granted the license. I had to write a business plan, an action plan. I had to identify board members, premises, funders, referral agencies. Wow. Um, it was detailed and uh, it was like Sanskrit to me. I didn't have a clue what I was doing, you know. And so when they did finally push the button, I was very well placed to just kick into action. And I remember when I got the email to say, congratulations, you are now uh, a licensed license holder for Dress for Success Dublin I burst into tears on the couch and I just said to Dave nothing will ever be the same again and Mm -hmm. that that was borne out because I suppose that building that organisation as a non-profit uh, was the precursor to me having the confidence to build for-profit business Interesting Yeah You think that gave you the the, Wow Yeah And like it's 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 probably the harder path, right? You probably yeah, but, chose the harder one first. Yeah, but when first. you're a total greenhorn and you don't know what's going on, you don't even know that, you know? I didn't know it was the harder path. <laughs> it's all hard. <laughs> I, I, I was listening to a pod this morning. They're like, they said essentially that. They're like, this is hard. This is hard. Pick your heart. I was like, that's fair. Yeah, fair totally. enough. So you, I think there's a value in naivety, right, though, isn't there? 
oh, there's a big listen, value on Avery. You're talking to the mother of twins. I had, you know, <laughs> two little tiny babies. I didn't know the difference. I didn't know how much harder that was than one tiny baby. Uh, you know, so you just get on with it, yeah. you know. I think you can overthink everything, right? Totally. You can overthink on it. And the, the, before we had our daughter, I was like, I'm just not going to listen to people. Because everyone's like, oh, things are never going to be the same again. Oh. I was like, we're embracing it. Yeah. We're just taking every single day as it comes and yeah. just enjoying it. Because people often put their perceptions onto you. Yeah. They can put on their, how they've viewed the world. And anyway, that's a different conversation. So. What was Dress for Success initially? What was the original idea? So it what, was, you got the license. What were we off doing now? We were uh, offering a boutique service uh, free to clients to clothe them for interview. Um, and then we, I remember we made uh, another intentional decision at board level to be the best Dress for Success for Dublin, not for worldwide. So we operated on a ask for forgiveness, not permission basis, and we evolved the service to meet the needs of, of the community that we served. And it grew to be a much more holistic model, um, career coaching, um, financial literacy, well-being, networking, Okay, so it was just mentorship. one piece, but you're like, I'm going to layer on all these other bits Totally, on top. Okay, totally. Gotcha. Um, because in a way, the clothing piece was just the bit you could see above the waterline. All yeah. the other stuff was where the real value was. Um, and, and about two years into that organisation, um, I started to realise that actually we were launching all these women into careers um, in hostile environments where there were hidden landmines that were stopping them from meeting their potential. And so suddenly you realise, well, actually, this isn't about fixing the women, it's about fixing the system. And our advocacy uh, arm was born. We um, started to agitate about the gender pay gap at that time to call for gender pay gap reporting. And we co-founded the workplace, uh, cross-party workplace uh, equality committee in the Oireachtas. And that became about influencing policy at government and business, senior business level um, to to really reevaluate the business landscape, how fit they were for purpose for women. Um, and so we would have been very vocal in calling for the gender pay gap uh, reporting legislation and part of that um, I would have been an expert witness to uh, the Oireachtas Committee on Gender Equality following the um, Citizens Assembly and uh, we're very embedded now at a ministerial level around policy change uh, you know gender pay gap reporting is simply a mechanism to deal with a symptom it's by far not the pebble upstream um, it is still seen as a compliance issue. I think we need to change the mindset now to look at um, giving social permission to move towards a more equal society and giving men permission to be the main part of that solution because men still hold the balance of power. Mm. Um, and I think it's a very, very difficult time for men because they're not sure what the right thing is to do. They're slightly paralysed by causing offence, saying the wrong thing, uh, displacing their peers, their male peers. It's it's a really difficult time. And, you know, I went back during COVID and did a master's in business, equity, diversity and inclusion, as did Brendan. And um, to, to kind of dig really deeper into what, excellent looks like okay uh, on a, on a global scale and we went we took the cross party group to Iceland on a study tour to meet the elected elect ministers uh, industry groups trade unions women's rights movements and the prime minister um, I have to say that was a bit of a career high sitting in in chambers with in a private audience with the Prime Minister and and the cross party group who all push me forward. I was like, oh, so I'm in charge. Okay, <laughs> and and we asked them all the same question. We said, what? Well, why there? Why why Iceland? Because Iceland has been the most gender equal country for the last ten years. Really. And we asked all of those people the same question. We said, um, what are the levers that have made Iceland the most equal country in the world? And they all said the same thing: sustainable, affordable childcare, uh, legislation for shared parental leave on a lose-it-or-lose-it lose basis and a kite mark for uh, equality 
an equitable practice on goods and services. What does that mean? So what that means is um, that if you are a business, a service or a product that adheres to equitable practice, that you wear a badge, like an okay. ISO mark. Like a guaranteed Irish. A guaranteed or a Irish, yeah, guaranteed okay. equal. And um, in fact, I met with the Minister for Equality yesterday and we're, we were talking about the new portal for gender pay gap reporting that's about to launch. And we were discussing the the possibility of um, having having a scoring system for businesses that report that moves beyond the actual pay gap because the pay gap itself is is one metric. So whatever your pay gap is, say you're in um, a meat processing factory, you, you probably are predominantly male. It's not a very, it's a gender segregated sector. Yeah. You know, there are issues there around um you know, the gender pay gap and, and I'm sure that there are segregated functions within that organisation as well. What if scores were given for your will to change it, for your action plan, your your time bound goals, your, your progression, mm. uh, even if that progression includes regressive numbers in reporting, if if the if the will to move the dial is there. Sometimes it has a long tail and it can have a negative impact. Um, so I think we need to start creating carrots around moving businesses to equitable practice. Yeah, I'm a big believer in that. I think it has to be, uh, we had Chupi on just before Christmas and she, we were talking about how I little. think I got a mention in Chupi's. Uh, I think you probably did. <laughs> yeah, you see, Chupi's brilliant. She like, sure is. Like she was talking about how little investment goes into female founders. And 2%. We were t- yeah. It's bonkers, right? And we were talking about that and she had, she had a beautiful insight into it has to be profitable on both sides. Totally. People need to be incentivized. Like either it's carrot or stick. Stick is used more often than not, but really it should be carrot when by, if it was far more profitable to invest in female founders. Totally. If it was far easier, if it was far more accessible. Talk to me about this sustainable childcare piece because... That's uh, that's piqued your interest now. <laughs> yeah. So in For theory, obvious reasons. <laughs> <laughs> Hypothetically speaking, <laughs> if somebody. <laughs> <laughs> so we're very lucky. We we got into a crash out beside us, and they're wonderful. Like it's it's a bizarre experience, and they're wonderful. But you do see how much pressure there is, and it's, it's, you know it's like a military operation. You see all the parents coming in the morning, they're dropping them off, and then I was checking my app just before I came on here just to see was she okay and. You know, there's a lot to it. So how, and the, and the model is, is it's damn expensive, right? Let's call it what it is, but they're looking after your most important thing in the world. So, you know, it is what it is. But how have Iceland managed to do it sustainably? So they have um, a dedicated fund from um, tax revenue uh, that funds childcare in its municipalities. So it is locally funded by government. Um, and there is a positioning switch around early childcare. It is seen as early childhood education and starts from the age of two. And it is seen as the right of the child to access early childhood education. Interesting. Now, that's, that is interesting because it's a complete repositioning. Yeah of the rights of the child to be socialised. That's fascinating. Yeah. yeah. Away from the whole babysitting model and where are we going to put them between Thursday and Friday? How to put them as if it's like some package you need to like keep in a warehouse. Parcel motel. Pretty much, right? So that's fast, that 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 reframing. Totally. I love that. Yeah. And and I think, you know, th- what, what they have done there is really interesting. Um, Katrin Jakob's daughter joined the women's strike recently in November. Um, 100,000 Icelandics men and women uh, marched for for equity because they believe they they still haven't got there yet even though they're the world leaders. And I think that's really, that sort of self-awareness is really important going forward. Um, But because they have, because they split parental leave, they see it as the right of the father to uh, take his time um, as a parent. Uh, Again, a reframing. Yeah. Whereas it's what did they do when we say they split? How does that work? Like I think numerically? it's six, six, and two. So it's six, f- six allocated to the mother, six allocated to the father, non-concurrent, and two toggleable. 
two or three toggleable, so you, they okay. can decide who takes the two or three gotcha. or whether it's split. Um, and and so now, uh, Icelandic men are very involved in early stage child rearing from from infancy. Um, and and Katrine said something very interesting. She said, as a result, the values of our society has changed. Wow. And you could feel it on the street. Really? It was missing a kind of a, don't shoot me, a performative maleness. There was a comfort. There was a sort of a, an, an ease. ease. A confidence. Yeah. 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 Okay. Yeah. That's fascinating. Yeah. So for us right now, because I always like to come up with solutions in, in Ireland and kind of come up with like practical things for employers, what could maybe they do right now? Like let's say 2024, right? Okay, let's pick one task, right? This is going to be yeah. our task. What could they do? I see the role of senior leadership role modeling as vital. So a lot of policies have been put in place that are being adopted by women and not by men. Say a lot more women are taking four day weeks than men because men see taking a four day week as detrimental to their career path. I read something about this yeah. recently, yeah. And yet women are taking it because it's impossible to function as a mother, as a working mother, you know, on five days in the office and particularly in high pressure environments it's very rare for men to take up um, take up the, those offerings um, and I'd love to see really progressive companies saying and in fact the multinationals have it down pat anyway because they've been through all the territories they've been through all the compliance they've seen the results they know it's good for business so it's it's harder when you get down the food chain down into the right. SMEs right and even into our homegrown bigger companies because um, that knowledge maybe isn't there um, but even to even to deploy uh, a sort of a gender utopian pilot where men and women adopt the same systems and the same policies around leave and caring duties so just see how it goes don't do, like you can't create a level playing field when the rules are different for the genders it sounds so simple when you say it. <laughs> you know, it just sounds like the whole n premise of this podcast is experimentation. I believe business is just a series of hundreds and thousands of experiments run every single day. That's what business is. And I think for something like this as well, you have to experiment. You have to try. Like the most logical thing does seem like just, just match it. Just make it the same. Have you come across um, the concept of the curb cut effect? No. So the curb cut the curb effect. Curb cut effect. Curb cut effect. Uh, it is basically curbs were cut by by um, uh, urban planners to allow access to wheelchairs. That in turn gave access to suitcases, prams, yeah, rolling bicycles, skateboards rollerblades, anything with wheels could use a curb cut to access the path from right. the road. So the initial removal of a barrier to one group Okay, I get you. Yeah. Created access points in the same way that text messaging was originally designed for deaf people to communicate. Really? Yep. So by removing a barrier to entry to one group you unlock huge benefits for all. And the unintended consequences that can be good and bad, but often, sometimes, it, you hear it so often. Oh, we originally come up with the idea for this, <laughs> it ended up being an idea for this, we didn't even realise. Like, you hear that so often. Why, obviously this is like, my passion is experimentation. Why are people so afraid to experiment with things like this? Um, I think it's difficult in a business environment to justify experimentation because it is, by definition, costly. Um, and and preserving the right to fail has to be part of that. Yeah. Um, so it takes a lot of courage for senior leaders to to enshrine that. Is it a mental barrier rather than a monetary barrier, though? I think it depends. I think that it depends what level of the organisation you're at. I mean, there is, you know, a, a lot of research around the middle tranche of management um, being in this kind of invidious position where they are, you know, above the people below them, um, beneath the people above them, and this kind of heat-sealed barrier that can stop the messaging from 
from traveling from the top down to the the grassroots, if you like, mm. because there is a cost involved with that. It could be social, it could be political, it could be financial. So, so in the middle, messages are received, and that middle has to process that message and decide how it's going to be acted okay, upon. Okay. Yes. And 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 mitigate against any potential negative consequences. So it's a it's a tricky position. So you might now the the truth is if 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 leadership act it out every day, it trickles down. Mm. But if it's only words, it tends to stop. Mm. How do we accelerate it? That's the key, the key question I ask every founder that comes on, especially every female founder that comes on. Like, how do we accelerate this? Is it knowledge? Is it carrot? What is it? I think it's permission. I think it's social, social permission. So when I look back at research that Work Equal did with behaviour and attitudes, uh, nationally based, um, representative of our population, 74% of the population want to see change, uh, closing the gender pay gap as a priority of government and business. Now that is a massive majority see this as the right thing to do. What we're missing is the tools and the per permission to turn that into action. So my vision is um, a national awareness campaign around the benefits of an equal society uh, where men such as Killian Murphy, Roy Keane, Hosier stand up and say, I am the solution. I am part of the problem, but I am part of the solution. And I think uh, a bit of vulnerability and an open discussion is the next stage of awareness. Mm. So that 74% says they're aware there's a problem and it needs to be fixed. We need to give permission now. And I can't give permission. But influential, influential men who are icons and role models can. And they can change the conversation um, around how we parent, how we care for our elderly, how we um, support promote and sponsor uh, everybody equally regardless of identity in our businesses. Yeah. Not just because they sound like us, walk like us, talk like us, went to the same school as us, but because um, everybody has the right to be met where they are and the right to progress. Um, on merit, mer we can get in and have a huge big conversation about meritocracy, which would take another whole pod podcast. Um, but I think when we look at the research and we see the the impact of creating company cultures where everybody feels valued and part of the mission, um, the business benefits are there. The cultural benefits are there. And, and it almost by definition can't help but trickle out by osmosis yeah. into how we live as a society because the walls of our businesses are not impenetrable. We we take those cultural mores home with us. Um, you know, in many ways, we set them around the kitchen table and in the classroom, in, you know, the, the kindergartens. We need to start thinking about the, 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 the norms that we're teaching our kids, challenging them and 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 creating new cultures in which the idealists can thrive when they get in there. Why is there such you, you touched on this almost in the very first five minutes of the pod, and I've wanted to come back to it ever since. Why is there such a divisiveness at the minute? I know this is a very very hot topic, but like, why is there such a feels like there's such divisiveness in Ireland at the minute? I think globally. So I suppose if you look back at history, there are periods. Um, and I was only thinking this, I was brushing my teeth this morning. I was like, this is almost like the era of pain. It's, it's, there's been so much pain, so much horror, war, pestilence, plague, whatever you're having yourself. Yeah. It's, and, and it has created uh, that divisiveness. Um, I think it's also around inequality in our societies. Um, there is um, an amazing book, it's, it's some years old now at the moment, called The Spirit Level, which, which digs into the research around growing economies. And as, a, as an economy is growing, 
um, everybody everybody rises, both financially and in terms of mental well being. Um, you know, self-efficacy, all of that stuff rises, rises, rises. But then when it reaches a sort of an economic peak, um, that those ancillary benefits trail off um, as a society becomes more unequal. Um, There's a huge amount of research around this. And I think, you know, you talk about innovation and you talk about multiple experiments. We're, we're, We're very embryonic as a, as a, as a society in this form. We haven't been doing it for terribly long and we're not doing it terribly well, to be honest <laughs> with you. So, you know, I think it is an opportunity um, in a very hot environment to start thinking about where we throw the pebble in the stream and actually how can we support people to feel valued at all levels of our society? Mm-hmm. Not, not just from our lovely position of privilege, but... Who are we leaving behind? Yeah. And what is the collateral damage that comes out of that? Uh, I put up the, on social that you were coming on and someone made a really lovely comment. It's not a question, it's just a comment. They're like, Sonia is the perfect example of someone sending the ladder back down. I thought that was lovely. Yeah, I think I think it's important. You know, I think it's really important. And, and actually, I've had this conversation with so many people. There's horrible research out there into the um, NY Police Department about women in senior leadership pulling the ladder up and why is that and the research says that it is a it is an absolute behavior pattern um but the conclusion is that there are so few women in leadership um that they are uh, a minority and when you are a minority you minimize your difference so you try to be as male as your counterparts wow. um not to draw attention to yourself and by putting the ladder back down, inviting other women to join you, you're actually throwing a spotlight on your difference. So it's a self-protection mechanism. So I, the, the goal then is to get to sort of a, a holistic 360 representation, not table by table, but, but, but whole, whole view by whole view. Where is the diversity? Where is the difference? You know, where are the different accents? Where are the different backgrounds? abilities, you know, identities, genders, sexualities, where where are they across the full span of who you are as an organization? Are things getting better? Yeah. Yeah. I think there's an opportunity there. There's a lot of awareness. There's a lot of accolades being given to people who are doing it really, really well. And and so that creates a sort of a a through flow of early early adopters. And we we know more. Every year we know more about why this is so important. Um, but we need to protect what we have as well. Um, we can't be complacent about the the wins that we've had. Like I, I was in the European Parliament um, at a session called the Eradication of Women's Rights in Europe. And like, it's just like, hang on a second, lads. <laughs> How is this happening? How is this happening? You know, um, in places like Poland and Turkey, and and I I think we should be very worried about the rise of the right. And mm. you know, you only have to look left at Trump Trump's win yesterday to think, well, what are we doing, lads? Yeah, you don't have to look far. No, and you don't have to look very hard. There's multiple examples now. It's kind of like, geez, sometimes you feel like you're bombarded with all this information. You're like, God. Is this good news? Is this bad news? Like you're kind of surrounded by so much information. You're trying to, that's why I love having people like yourself on who've done the research, who know the answers, even the, the pulling the ladder up phenomenon. Like I'd heard, anecdotally, I had heard female founders talk to me about this and female leaders talk to me about this going, look, anecdotally, I've heard this and I've seen this in action, um, but I'd never understood the reason why, but it's fascinating for breaking that down. Before we get to our quick fire round, Talk to me about Len and Courtney. Where is kind of the, the plan for this year? What's the, you said global expansion. What does that look like for you? So Kilkenny Design already have um, geo-specific sites in the UK and the US. Um, we are doing a showcase in the RDS as part of showcase, private sh- showcase for 80 international buyers and an international press pack next week. I think I mentioned that already, but um, yeah, it's 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 a seeding process Um that is going to be bedded into our marketing plan. Um, it's it's not going to happen overnight, um, but we know that the market is out there. 
we know what we do is unique um, and that women love us for it. Um, so we just have to get more people to the party. If I was giving you a magic wand, you've done a lot of executive coaching work. So I would give you a magic wand. What would like, what does sign you want now? What's your kind of success for you in business? I think I really want to acknowledge that I'm very proud of where I've come to and content with where I am right now. I am never complacent, ever, but I am content. Proud, not satisfied. I love yep. it. We'll get to our quick fire round. What book would you recommend every entrepreneur should read? I ref there's so many. I mean, I, I have read. Give as many as you like. So We're book many. nerds on this podcast. Okay. So give as many as you want. Um, I love the hard things. The hard thing about hard things. Ben Horowitz. I love um, the six working types of genius. Patrick Lencioni. I love you touched on it. Cho Choice Theory um, is a fantastic book. Can't remember the author. Haven't well, heard of it. I'm going to buy that oh, straight away. You're going to die. <laughs> um, Can't believe someone's robbed my idea. Yeah. Choice um, Theory. Okay. There's so many. I mean, I love uh, Pat. What's his name? Oversubscribed is one of it. He has a trio of oh, books. Oh, they're excellent. They're yes. Excellent. Oversubscribed is brilliant. Yeah. yeah. And uh, the first one is really good. Is that not Daniel Priestley? I'm trying to think what it, his name is. It is Daniel is Priestley. Daniel Priestley? I think he could be right there. I certainly am a fan of Daniel Priestley, whatever he did write. Um, there's so many and I'm really happy to put in a list afterwards. And yeah, actually great. what I what I can do for the show notes is put in a really accessible list of material around equity and equi equity That'd practices. Brilliant. Yeah, the more stuff we can put in the show notes, the better because often like you sometimes, you know, an hour isn't long enough often to actually get into it. So that'd be brilliant. Appreciate that. What's something you had to learn the hard way? Oh, it's something I had to, most of it seemed like it had to be learned in a really hard way. <laughs> um, I think, I think courage and the courage to take risks wasn't in my initial makeup. Um, when I look back as, at, at me, a much younger me, I was, you know, a bit of a ruminator, a bit of a worrier. Um, definitely would have been a bit more fearful. Um, but then once I started making some high risk decisions, I realized there's quite a buzz to it. <laughs> <laughs> one extreme to the other. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And, and you know, you, you take one risk, even if it's a little one, and you realize oh, it wasn't so bad. And it unlocks something. It's a mini muscle, isn't it? Mini like muscle. You just build yeah. a muscle, muscle every time you do a rep. Yeah. Yeah, I like that. That's a good answer. What have you sacrificed to achieve your success? Um, I'm very lucky I didn't break more. I'm very lucky that um, that some of the relationships in my some of the important relationships in my life survived uh, what I put myself through um, it could have been worse could have been worse um, and I think that it's very hard to have um, a balcony view of the impact of your actions when you're in the thick of it mm. much easier in retrospect mm. Yeah, retrospect is always the one, isn't it? But it's great to be able to catch it in time. What valuable business do you believe no one is building? So Jacintha Ardern recently uh, changed the law in New Zealand before she left her position around... Um, equal pay for e work of equal value. Um, and she did a massive piece of research to determine the, the key elements along a matrix of uh, physical, emotional, psychological, educational. So what are all the elements of your ability to do a job and where are there jobs of equal value? Um, and the case was brought through the trade unions by a care worker, I believe. And it, that care worker was found to do work of equal value to a prison officer, but was paid 30% less. And 
with the stroke of a pen, Jacinta Ardern said, all of the state workers who plot along this matrix and who do work of equal value will be paid the same. And the private industry went up in smoke, like raging, saying it's easy for you to do that. This is These are state salaries. Uh, how do you expect private, private industry to respond to this? Um, we won't be able to rise our salaries um, in the same way that you've just done. And she said, any business that relies on underpaying women to make a profit has a broken business model. And I think there's a huge opportunity. By the way, let's not forget that women make up, depending on which research you read, anywhere between 89 and 96 percent of all consumer decisions. There is a massive opportunity for businesses who understand the value of that yeah. and build cultures that are fit for purpose for today's world. What an answer. <laughs> There's about 10 businesses there. People can go. <laughs> I actually spoke to a company yesterday and they were, that was their whole thing. I was like, oh, send me over your you know, ideal customer profile. And they're like, well, 85% of decisions are made by females. So our main customer is actually female market. And it was kind of like a, almost not like a masculine kind of brand. So I thought that was fascinating. What's something in your kind of daily routine or life you wish it started doing sooner? Fitness, I think. Um, I've become really, really into fitness uh, fitness for strength, um, weight training, running, Pilates, yoga, whatever you're having yourself, whatever the day brings, um, it is now part of my daily r routine in a way that I've had to build to it. It hasn't just happened out of nothing. Um, but I see that not as, um, it's not a surefire answer, but it's the best insurance policy for me to live the longest, most fruitful health span that I can. Yeah, I love that. I think it's so powerful and you almost have to give yourself that permission. Mm -hmm. you got to treat it like a, an appointment. Yep. That's how I think of it. I put it into the diary. Anything goes in the diary has to be treated like yep. an appointment. I love it. Um, I'm going to give you one million euro, but you can only give it to one person or a company. Who would you give it to? I'd give it to Lift Ireland, which I haven't spoken about, um, which is the other non-profit that I co-founded which is rolling out a programme for all of Ireland to understand what good leadership looks like um, by self-analysis, self-appraisal under the themes of listening, accountability, competence, empathy and understanding, honesty, um, all the fine foundational elements of good characters of leadership. Um, we're rolling it out to 300 schools at the moment for free. We have about 120 corporate partners, uh, including government departments. Um, we've served 60,000 people plus through the programme at the moment. The aim is to get to 10% of the population to reach a tipping point. Um, we're working with the pri prison services, addiction services, community groups, sports groups. It is the most democratic and accessible self-improvement program that you can get. It's available for free. You can go on to liftireland.ie online and book in an online roundtable. Um, and it's reflection time. It's self-improvement time. And it is proven to improve our understanding of leadership and our behaviour. Mm, I think especially this time of year, a lot of people are in that mindset, so yeah. definitely a good one to look at now. What do you believe that some people would find strange or strongly disagree with? That I believe in? Yeah. What is your belief that other people find strange or contradict you on? I don't know. I really don't know the answer to that. So I'm quite vocal. Um, I'm particularly vocal on LinkedIn. Um, and, and open and honest on LinkedIn. Um, Rare. Well. <laughs> Rare on LinkedIn. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Usually people are like, I'm delighted to announce. Yeah. I'm so happy to partner with. Usually it's quite uh, fluffy. Yeah. Well, I think I, I, I love it as a medium. I love writing, actually. Um, and I haven't... Maybe it's because the people who follow me are also part of my echo chamber. I haven't found a huge amount of dissenters to my musings and thoughts. Um, and even 
even when I do, there are people who think, who still think that the 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 gender equity drive and in fact general equity drive is um, either futile or bogus. <laughs> like the, it, but you kind of have to say, well, those people are moving into obsolescence anyway. Yeah, so I, my job is not to educate them. My job is to walk around that situation, navigate it. Perfect example. What's one thing in your personal life that you spend money on that brings you immense happiness? Food and wine. <laughs> yeah, yeah, definitely. We're a very gastronomic family. Okay. Uh, we cook a lot. I cook a lot. Um, yeah, I'm very happy when I have a glass of champagne in my hand. It doesn't happen all the time, but I like it when it does. Um, yeah, I would spend my money on on food, fun, friendship. Yeah, those are the good things. What's one final piece of advice you have for every entrepreneur listening? Gather people around you who can do what you can't do. And I heard this only this morning on the way in. Be the conduit, not the candidate. It's not about you doesn't matter how it happens. Just get it to happen. That's beautiful. I've never heard that one before. Be the conduit, not the candidate. Sonia, where can people contact you? I'm at Sonia Lennon across pretty much most platforms. Um, SoniaLennon.com is my website. Um, yeah, be delighted to engage. Sonia, that was a pleasure. Thank you so much. Thank you. Made it all the way to the end. Click here to subscribe to the channel. Click here to listen to last week's interview. We do these interviews every single week. So hit subscribe. I'll see you in a few days.